One of the biggest obstacles to a full and giving concert experience for children is a small rectangular board on a tripod. I'm referring, of course, to that evil spoil sport of any musical performance, the music stand. I know it's very popular and it's very practical in rehearsal, but in concerts, I fight it with a vengeance, even though I'm actually standing behind something right now. Well, let's not focus on that anyway. If you put a music stand between you and your audience, especially an audience of children, you might as well build a brick wall. It'll steal your focus, it block the view for the audience, and will to some extent disconnect you from them. But remove that evil board and great possibilities arise. Suddenly you can't hide anymore. You'll have to look up, lift your head, look at the audience, acknowledge their presence. Uh, that's much appreciated by audiences, I can assure you. For now, the audience can catch your eye and look right back at you. Suddenly their view is clear and they can follow what you do when you play your instrument. They can follow your hands moving, uh, or fingers moving, or the strike of the bow and everything. Of course, this means that you'll be forced to learn your music by heart. But strenuous and time-consuming as that may be, the rewards are numerous. You reach deeper levels of understanding of the music you're playing. You'll have to interact more and listen more carefully to your fellow musicians to keep track of the music. And because of that, with great certainty, you'll probably improve your uh, ensemble sound as you go along. And you'll suddenly be free to use your body to move about, react, and communicate the music even better. And how to communicate the music better is exactly what we're here to discuss today. So let me show you three brief examples of classical ensembles that have chosen or been forced to dispose of uh, this performance crutch. And this is a crutch that guarantees a limp, I might add. And because of that, they have freed themselves as musicians and opened up a wide communication highway between them and their audience. The first, the first example is a string quartet called uh, the Diani String Quartet. These four musicians toured with Shostakovich's eighth uh, string quartet, playing for the 13 to 16 year olds. And this uh, concert started as a typical string quartet set up with the musicians sitting down with note stands in front of them. Uh, during the production works, uh, work, I gently, uh, or actually rather insistingly, coaxed them into learning the music by heart so that they could throw away their music stands. Immediately, their eternal, uh, internal uh, musical communication became so much more interesting to watch. And it also helped them to communicate better to the young audience that was going uh, to hear uh, what was going on in the music. After the first tour, they threw away the chairs as well, except the cello, even though you can actually get a string that holds the cello. But, but she's, she's, she's staying in her chair. But in order to be able to use the room and their bodies more actively uh, in the communication of, of the music, there's actually a need that emerged while touring. So a kind of choreography developed with changing groupings for the different movements and changing interactions between the musicians within each uh, movement, underlining the development of the music. Uh, <laughs> add to that uh, uh, th that they made carefully uh, planned introductions to each movement, so they actually intercepted the movements, didn't play it all at once, but one movement at a time. Uh, with engaging personal thoughts about the music combined with the historical facts surrounding this piece and Shostakovich's life and career under the tyranny of Stalin. So the result was explosive and made this performance so much more personal and touching than their original conventional approach and helped open the minds and ears of their young audience using no props whatsoever. All it took was their voices, bodies and instruments and an open concert space to move in. I'll show you a little example here. Get this started, I hope so. Chung chung.
Uh, anyway, the next example is uh, uh, a Danish recorder duo, Tansi and Mansi, they're called. Well, um, and they've taken this approach a step further. In a wordless performance, they combine movement and mime skills with the Baroque music of Bach and Telemann in a performance for children aged six to nine. In a rather minimal scenography, a story of two characters develop, expressed through the music of two recorders of variable uh, sizes playing, supported and underlined by their choreographer uh, bodywork. And here's a short example of that. If I can get to it. Okay, finally, I'll, I'll uh, present you with a four-minute shortened presentation of a very dramatic concert makeover that we experienced at our yearly International Producers Forum at the YAM Festival in uh, Zagreb, Croatia in 2015. Wouter van Looy, uh, who's the uh, artistic director of the Sonso Company, uh, together with Swedish producer Katarina Bonanda, uh, managed to transform a very traditional string quartet concert setup into a completely different and very moving artistic experience, using a lot of the tools that we're here to advocate. The four excellent musicians in the Pouring String Quartet worked with our two colleagues for just two short sessions, and the result was staggering. The music was still the same, everything else had changed. The music stands remained, though, but they, rem they managed to find a way around them. Let's see what happened, and I'll st stop a little bit uh, during and comment, but uh, let's see here. No? If you go with a five-year-old to a concert, they go to a concert. And whether it's John Cage or Beethoven or Miles Davis, they don't care, no? They go to a concert. They are the audience now and what's happening between them and the musicians, that's what it's about. You have to bring them into this uh, heaven of music in some way. And then you have to have musicians that can communicate over this uh, note stance. Even though they need the note stance, they need to read the notes, but uh, you can also communicate in another way. And with the audience, that's the aim. And that's where the classical music is very often stuck because they always use the same approach. They think it's so important to explain music history but I think the quality of the music is so strong that you don't need all this. We can prepare the children in the classroom. We can tell them about the instruments, what they cost, what the musicians are. And then we, we leave that in the classroom. 
and when they come to the concert, they should have the music. Yeah, as you can see, this is a, a very traditional setup. Four musicians gazing into the note stands, uh, audiences in long rows of chairs. I was in the 10th row and I didn't feel connected to the stage at all. It's just too far away. Uh, and then in the middle, they really wanted to tell them a lot about the instruments and experience them, which was very admirable. They brought all the children up on stage. You see, this took about 10 minutes, 15 minutes perhaps of the concert. Everybody, and very, you know, very commendable that they want to, they really wanted to share their music with the children. Uh, and they talked a lot, and, and so more a learning experience than an artistic experience, actually. But let's see how, uh, how they made this more relevant, personal, and expressive. Let's continue. Now, it, this uh, footage from the, from the rehearsals and from the live concert, but... Uh, <laughs> Now it's dark as we enter the room, and we're in a circle around the stage. So you see here how they solved the problem with the note stands? They needed the notes, they couldn't learn the music by heart one day, you know. So, so uh, instead, they placed them like this. So this meant that everybody in the audience was sitting behind one of them. And then you could see the rest easily, but you could also see this person you were sitting behind. You could follow what they were watching, and you could see the music, and, and suddenly it got exciting, you know, instead of being an obstacle. Okay, so. <laughs> Is it possible for you, musicians, to overdo the playing more with your body? The next paper. And the next paper has one word, which is game. And it takes a while to understand what you can do also yeah. uh, when you are the person going round, because it's very interesting to <laughs> listen. You can see what they're doing now. Instead of bringing all the children up on stage and explaining the differences between the instruments, and then, then they demonstrate it with music. You know, They play a little Mozart thing, and then when you tap the shoulder one, they stop playing. And when you tap it again, they start playing again. So they invite someone to go and do that. And it's, it doesn't matter that it's only one or two persons that does it. It's really fun to watch. And at the same time, you immediately understand how the relationships are between the strings and how the sounds are different, because suddenly they're focused very smart way, I thought. You know? And very time consuming, too. No, the opposite. Time saving. That's, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. Very efficient. And not a word spoken, just, it's self-explanatory, actually. <laughs> it is very beautiful. It's so intimate, you know, you are so close to you. And to really see you making this magical contact, even when you are not looking at each other, and then sharing it with the audience, it's all about this. I can see on your face what you feel when she's playing. <laughs> really, really, I'm so near. Love is really. <laughs> Here we go. A lot of good ideas to steal. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. Thank you.
thank you for Jasper actually introducing our artistic director. Uh, I wanted to do it myself, but it was not um, necessary anymore. Um, my name is Emma Driesprong and I work for Zonse Company. We're in um, a theater, we make music theater and we're based in Belgium. Um, our artistic director that you just saw, Wouter van Looy, was supposed to be here, but he's these kind of persons that is like busy and he always says yes to everything. And actually like a couple of weeks ago, it turned out that he came back from Mexico and he goes to Dublin next week. And all of a sudden, like it was like, okay, maybe I need to rest also. So that's why I'm here and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I was asked actually to talk about two of our performances. Um, maybe I can just quickly tell you what we're doing. Um, like Orkan, actually they're like a little bit our Dutch colleagues. We make music theater for children. Um, the starting point, as um, the others also said, it's always music. We make performances about jazz, contemporary music, classical music. We also work with sound art. And um, in general, I say in general because there are exceptions, there are no words in our performances. Um, we always work with uh, professional mu musicians, really good musicians, that also often play for an uh, adult public. So they're not only like playing for, for young audiences, but they also have like other projects. And we like that because that they have like yeah, an, another mindset, let's say. Um, we always combine this with a theatr theatrical uh, setup and we work a lot with multimedia. So you will see also in the examples that we work a lot with video and the interaction with the musicians and the videos that, that makes like the, perf the performance. Um, and last but not least important to, men uh, to mention is um, in many of our performances we try to increase the involvement with the public. Um, and I will show you later how we do it in our two performances. Um, I was asked to, um, to uh, present two of our performances. That's Bach, which we produce, co-produce with Orkan. And um, I was asked to um, present Milestones, which we co-produce with Centre Cultural de Belém in Lisbon. Um, maybe I can show you first a little teaser. I'm sorry, I'm just, yeah this to get to give you an idea what the performances are like so I want to stop here because actually I'm spoiling a little bit my presentation, but this is where the interaction is starting. I was like, I need to stop it. Um, so this is Bach. It's about, uh, I, it's about the music Bach, uh, the music of Bach. And um, um, wait a second. And as you can see in the videos we use, because the videos that you saw, they're like part of the projections in the, in the, um, in the, um, how do you say it, the performance. And we often work also for the projection with children. Yeah. Um, and then about milestones. Um, it's funny when we were making this, um, when we were making this, uh, this presentation, we realized milestones is, um, we made it in two 2014. It was before I started working for Zonzo. And, um, we realize it's, it, maybe it looks a bit old school because also it's a long time ago, but also it's because of the, it's milestones because of Miles David. So it's all about the, the um, jazz scene in New York. Um, yeah, and uh, we realize it's maybe not the best video, but this is a, a, a performance that has been, um, la, yeah, it, it was like everywhere. So it was very popular. So sometimes you need like, don't need like the best video to, to sell like your, uh, your projection, let's say. Um, to give you an idea of the ambience.
So, and what this little boy is doing, I will explain you later, of course. Um, just before I start to, to uh, really, um, because um, Liz especially asked me to, to um, uh, talk about interaction and how we uh, work with um, um, children, how we create interaction in our performances. And uh, I just want to mention some general aspects that I think or we think are important and that we use. Um, yeah, to increase the involvement actually, because that's like in these two performances quite um, important as part of the performance. Um, one of them, it's uh, authenticity, which means like the performance needs to be real and the interaction needs to be real. Um, actually, the idea is taking them serious, so the public, and um, yeah, we think um, it's instead of like using like, uh, how do you call that, fake, um, um, fake ways of doing, the interaction needs to be real and also um, if you ask them to do something it needs to be authentic. Um, then second of all what we always try in the performance is direct contact and how do you, also what you saw before in the video with Jasper, like um, we try that the, the, always to make sure that the audience is very close to the musicians and we always work also with different setups. So for instance, um, with uh, Bach, we decided instead of like, you know, like a front view, we decided like in the middle, the musicians are in the middle and on both sides, the public is on both sides. So that they can be very close to the musicians and they are really like in the performance. And we think that's very uh, important. Then um, mostly in the performances, there's space for initiative. Um, that has to do with the fact of the idea of impression and expression, which means like you, um, children come to your performance, and of course, for instance, if you talk about the music of Bach, um, you know, they, they need to listen, they need to concentrate, and we think it's also important to give them like a space where they can do something or that they can interact really, instead of only like listening and uh, looking at what is happening like um, on the stage in front of them. Um, then um, the instructions, um, so I will show it later, but the instructions, what we ask them to do, they're part of the performance. So in general, it works that the musicians, they, they're in the performance, they show something, and the idea is that the public, they interact without like explaining like, okay, this is what we're going to do, but it's really part of the performance. Um, this means also, all of these things, that means also like you're taking risks because of course you ask something from the public, which means also like if there's no reaction, um, you're like, okay, what are we going to do or where is this going to? Um, but I think that we think that can lead also to like an interesting exchange and also music, of course, it always, uh, there's always music and I will show you later also what the risks in these different performances are. Um, but what can, um, at the end, there's always like an interesting result, let's say. Um, yeah, and then as a conclusion, um, actually what, what if, you, if we talk about increasing the involvement, we think that the, ch the, the child or the public in, in, this, um, in this sense, um, they are like an active part of the artistic result. So that, that's actually in, the, in these two performances, that's our goal, that they are really active parts. And now I'm going to show you how in both performances um, we will do it. So in, for the, in the case of Bach, you need to imagine that like there's in the middle, it's a stage, but it's on the same floor. And then on both sides, there's like a projection screen. And actually it's always like the, the musicians are in the middle and it's always like an interaction with the, with the projections actually. And um, wait a second, give me one moment. Yeah, so which means like in Bach, they're really, the public is really close and it's, I think it's maximum 100 people. So which really like, it's quite an intimate setting. 100 people? Yeah, something like that. And, um, um, and um, what I said, like the instructions are part of the performance and I'm going to show you like the first video because then you can see like the two musicians. Oh yeah, that's what I forgot to say. It's like a performance with two uh, violins and one technician, so it's really like a, a small, uh, yeah, small crew. Um, I'm, this video shows how they give the instructions to the public. 
Oh yeah, no, I forgot to, to, to say one thing, sorry. Um, uh, the idea actually is to make them feel the music. And it, in this case, for Bach, it's the idea of um, letting them feel what the counterpoint is. So which means like action and reaction, you know, one note to the other. Um, and the idea is to uh, let them feel, okay, what does that mean, like action, reaction? So this is. B, A, C, H. B, A, This is actually what is on the floor. Ha. you got the idea this is continues this continues so actually idea is the musicians they install like a code so which means like you know they clap and there's like a sign on the floor so the public knows what to do and that's what the musicians they do like like for a couple of minutes to instruct in a certain way the public what you can see here is uh, the risk at the same time because you know the public it was it was not that loud what they were doing i think that's sometimes the, the, the risk with this performance, if like sometimes that happens that, there's, uh, there, that there are not 100 people, but maybe 40 or, or maybe 50, and uh, if they, then, then you know, then the rhythm and what they, what they do, like the impact, it's a little bit less, but at the same time, the idea is that the, what they do, it's authentic, uh, the authenticity of what they do, it's like real, because they know, okay, uh, we, we um, yeah, you know, they feel the rhythm and the idea is also that the public on both sides, they react, you know, they, they clap, then the other stems and that's actually uh, the idea also of the music of Bach and the counterpoint that you try to visualize that and to make them feel, yeah, this idea of counterpoint. Um, then the idea, uh, I'm going to show you now, um, we, uh, wait a second. Yeah, and this is the result. Actually, the idea is so. They, made, they did the instruction, and um, the performance continues, and then actually they start again to play, and then of, cor of course it's up to the public to, to clap and to stamp, and to, um, yeah, that's, you know, to actually to create together in a certain way. So I'm going to show you, because normally my colleague said, like here they clap really out loud. So that's maybe a good, good example. <laughs> Thank you. 
think I think it's a quite a clear example of what what I uh, just have been explaining. What what the fun thing is also about this uh, performance is the fact that it it um, toured like a lot like throughout Europe. And uh, of course, you don't need like another language. The only thing what was funny when we did it in Spain, the, the H, like it's in, in every language, like different. And the musicians, uh, sometimes they didn't realize. And I was like, oh yeah, it's a, different, uh, it's a different letter. But for the rest, it's really great to see like the different audiences in different languages, uh, in different countries, because they all, yeah, and they all love to clap and to interact. Okay, next, milestones. Okay, so milestones, it's uh, about Miles Davis or his music. Um, there are some aspects of his, of his life, but it's more about um, yeah, the world of the jazz music in New York. And um, it's with a trumpet player, it's with a pianist player, piano player, and it's with uh, a drum, uh, uh, how do you call it? Um, yeah, a drummer, thank you. Um, Two of those, what we often do, two of them, they play together in a jazz ensemble, and we ask them also like for a new performance. So they really, um, yeah, they really like to improvise already together. And the other one, Bert Bernard, um, they know each other, so they, you know, they they in, they improvise together. And actually, the setting um, for milestones is also to make the public feel okay. What is it like to improvise? And um, what they decided to do, actually I chose one part because there are several um, moments in this performance where they interact with the public, where they ask also the public to come like on stage, let's say. Um, the public is really like around, it's really um, also like a very cozy setting and the public is around and they're on the same level as the musicians because they're really like asked to come also to interact directly with the musicians. And um, here, what you see, which video I will show now, is that uh, the trumpet player, he shows actually the codes. So what's after, the public will copy. And the idea is, yeah, really like a jam session. What does it mean if you do like this? What does it mean like if you, if you play like louder, if you play, you know? It's really like actually a little bit a game what they, what they installed. So I'm going to show you. Okay, so you got the idea. This is the idea that he shows how to do it. And then um, there's a public, and I love this performance, especially when it's uh, with schools, because then you see, like, in general, um, if, like, a child, or it's always like, okay, who wants to do it? And in general, at the beginning, they're really like, okay, I don't know if I want to do it. And at the end, they all want to do it, because it's just a lot of fun. So the first, um, the first child, in general, is very shy, and then afterwards, there are like children that are really like, okay, I want to do this and I want to, um, yeah, do like the jam session. And I'm going to show you how one of the boys love doing this. <laughs> So actually, basically, the child decides, okay, what are we going to play? Um, and what I like, and what the musicians in general also like, you know, it's very close to what they do and what they like to do, because it's all about jamming, and of course, they really need to focus also on what the child is doing. And in that sense, it's really an, 
that if you talk about an authentic approach, it's really an authentic approach because you know they love doing it and it's really a direct contact and it's really like yeah, a challenge actually for both sides. And I think that's what really works very well. And I think that's a way of increasing like involvement that it's really like authentic and the authenticity and really like the direct contact, what makes it fun uh, yeah, for the musicians, but also for the public. Um, yeah, just to, to, to just uh, last but not least, it's fun. They, they've been created like a long time ago and they're still playing these performances. So um, yeah, there's something that's, yeah, that people really like about it. So yeah. Next. Actually, uh, my ancestors emigrated to North America in the 1600s from northern uh, Nottinghamshire, so I'm from here. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about best practice with, uh, with orchestras. And uh, I'd like to begin by just explaining some of the challenges, because orchestras have some natural communicative dis disadvantages for the type of, of music mediation that we're talking about today. Uh, the first one is that orchestras appear as scenery on stage. Uh, perceptually, when you've got nine or more than nine or 10 performers on stage, uh, they lose their individual identity and they become to be perceived as a, a sort of scenery and not as individual people. So that's one challenge. Uh, the other one is that orchestras play in large concert halls and usually uh, they're too large for, for audiences that, that aren't invested beforehand, like a young audience. Uh, musicians like to see their music and that also creates a, a, a visual relationship between me and my note stand and the conductor in my peripheral vision. And the audience really isn't a part of that picture. Music, musicians have to be able to hear each other. That makes untraditional seating and arrangements that open the orchestra spatially uh, a challenge. Musicians are dependent on chairs and music stands so that it makes them static and makes it difficult for them to utilize the space in the room in a dramatic way to, uh, to underscore the music. Uh, orchestras usually play to subscription audiences and the social contract with subscription audiences is sort of a take it or leave it kind of thing. Uh, young audiences don't buy tickets uh, and occasionally they don't even want to be there or don't know why they're there. And the challenge with young audiences is to produce the concert that they didn't know they wanted to be at. And that's an entirely different challenge than a subscription series audience. Um, traditional orchestra concerts usually contain codes and rituals. I mean, people come out and, and we clap for them and they shake each other's hands and they stand up and they play this, this tuning note and, and there's all sorts of things going on. And if we are comfortable with the codes, it gives us a sense of identity because we know, we know about this ritual, we're a part of it. Uh, if we don't know about the ritual, then we're on the outside of it and it makes us uncomfortable or makes us disconnect. Uh, anybody who's, who's ever, well, I've, I had a, uh, a colleague who, who was talking about building audiences for orchestras, saying, how do we get people to buy tickets for these wonderful orchestra concerts? And another colleague said, have, have you ever just gone out and bought a concert for a monster truck show? You know, it's, it's outside your realm of experience. What is going to get you in contact with it? Uh, and, and that it's all these social codes and rituals that need to be dis demystified and kind of deconstructed. Uh, educa educational departments usually lean on uh, classroom mediation, which means lots of historical facts. Uh, the fact that Prokofiev has an airport named after him in Donetsk, uh, is interesting maybe, but, but it doesn't really get you any closer to the music. But it's easy to teach, much easier than talking about the music, talking about the listening experience, which is very hard to uh, uh, make into a concrete thing. And it's also very hard to, uh, to quantify. So if, if you're gonna be giving a test and a grade, uh, you're better off talking about historical facts than you are talking about an aesthetic experience. So that's a challenge. 
Uh, and orchestra musicians are usually in a passive role in relationship to their audiences. Um, they're there to play, and that's been their job for as long as they've had their job. Um, the, there's an MC or a booklet of program notes that takes care of informing the audience, and they don't feel like that that's part of their job. So these are, these are all challenges, but, uh, but they're changing. These things are changing, and it doesn't mean they're going to be uh, any less of a place for the traditional orchestra concert, but we have to start thinking about audiences in a different way uh, and, and trying to see how we can change the, the form of the concert, uh, change the way that we communicate with the audience in order to uh, vitalize the traditional classical orchestra music concert. Let's take a look at some examples. just a little bit. Allegria is a young chamber orchestra uh, in Norway and they're, they're committed to playing from memory. Uh, they're committed to being movable. They work with uh, choreographers. But one of the most interesting they, things that they do is they do live spatial mixes of their classical repertoire on stage so that they move spatially in relationship to the audience but on the music's terms so that, that they've, they accentuate certain parts of the music by getting closer to the audience and fade away by doing other things and it's all, it's all about using the space. Let's go on to, wait a minute. <clears throat> Shadow Music is an award-winning uh, program that Orkam and the Norwegian Chamber Orchestra uh, did together that uh, was wonderfully effective, but places uh, exceptional demands on the performers. And shadow music, it's, it's like being lost in an entirely different world. Uh, it creates a universe for the music uh, by using a lot of stagecraft. Uh, another part of that project was uh, this, this performance of Verklerten Nacht by the Norwegian Chamber Orchestra. And the thing that I found really striking about this is because the, mu the musicians uh, were, were costumed and were movable and had memorized the memorized the entire Verklaar um, and dispensed with tuning on stage and warming up on stage. It created an, an opening sequence that was absolutely riveting because you have the audience uh, almost a blackout with, with a little bit of blue lighting and all of a sudden the audience is aware that musicians are on stage and the sound of the hall comes down and then almost like out of the darkness comes the, the, that first low cello note of Verklaar de Nacht, and the audience just gets sucked right into what's going on in stage. And it makes for the kind of dramatic, powerful start of a concert that, that you know, we associate with, with completely other kinds of uh, productions, um, where bam, it just hits you in the face. There's no ritual ahead of time. There's no waiting around. All of a sudden, you're in the middle of this wonderful piece of music. No. There we go.
an incredible way to start that piece. And the, the in interesting thing about this is uh, the Norwegian Chamber Orchestra has become, since these projects, has become absolutely dedicated to, to that sort of performance because they begin to realize that they can use the room and what that gives them as performers, what that gives them as chamber musicians, and also the fact that they don't have to see their music frees them to, to light their performances in dramatic ways. And it's opened up a, a whole new area of artistic endeavor for the entire orchestra. Uh, the next example is from the, the Mahler Chamber Orchestra in Switzerland and their artistic director, Leif, uh, the Norwegian pianist Leif Ove Ansnes. Um, and they do uh, concerts for, for uh, deaf audiences of children. Sensing the sound of a drum or the vibrations of a cello with your whole body. That's what the project Feel the Music from the Mahler Chamber Orchestra is all about. In some European countries, its musicians visit deaf and hard of hearing children in the classroom. In a second step, the MCO invites them into the orchestra's world. This time, three schools from Zurich and around Lucerne in Switzerland are taking part, a life-enhancing project for both children and musicians. I think when they sit close to the musicians and see their movements, they realize how energy is transmitted. And this is the reason why it's beautiful when they're with us, what they experience, and we can feel they're happy at a point. For instance, when the music is getting surprisingly loud or incredibly impulsive. Children are experiencing the sound of the instruments. They touch them, sit under the piano, and conduct the musicians. Reciprocal applause. It felt great because there were lots of violins playing in the orchestra. It was a beautiful feeling, the vibrations. Touching the instrument, I could feel it through my hand and my arm and my whole body. But also all the other instruments have transmitted vibrations to my body. Feel the Music is part of the Mahler Chamber Orchestra's Beethoven Journey concert series. It performs with famous conductors and soloists, such as the Norwegian pianist Leif of Ansnes. The idea for the workshop with deaf and hard of hearing children was born because of Beethoven, who himself turned hard of hearing in his 20s and later deaf, which totally influenced his compositions. Okay, and the rest is sort of an advertisement. Um, <laughs> but, but the point here is that they, they produced these concerts on the terms of the audience. It was an audience-centered audience uh, uh, concert and while it's it's very easy for us to say well of course you know they, they have to uh, take account for the audience when they're going to be playing for a deaf audience but actually we should be taking account for what the terms are of the audience for every audience we're producing for uh, the next one is preschool concerts with the Norwegian broadcast orchestra known as Kring Kostings Orchestra or Cork for short um, they solved the spatial problem by building up the orchestra on risers uh, throughout the room, and the children got to sit in among the risers. Um, it's interesting that, that originally there was a great deal of resistance to this from the orchestra. And so to begin with, they only had three islands of risers with, uh, with the, the musicians on them. And after they experienced the kids and the reaction and, and the, the intensity, of the concert situation with the children in among the risers, uh, the musicians themselves suggested splitting up into more numerous islands and becoming more and more fragmented. And as the musicians gained in confidence with this, this particular uh, spatial arrangement of the orchestra, uh, they ended up at, at the end with, you know, just two or three or four musicians on each set of risers. So there were lots of different islands. And the, uh, the playing rules of the concert, and this was for, for three to five-year-olds, was that when the music starts, you sit down. 
And when the music stops, if there's something you want to listen closer to, if there's an, a mus an instrument that you think is very interesting that you want to get closer to, to see or to listen to, then you can move over there. And when the music starts again, you sit down. And so the audience is kind of completely integrated inside the, the orchestra. And this is a, another example of an orchestra some, who, it was a little bit outside their comfort zone to, uh, to start doing this, but after, they, af after they've felt the, the repercussions of doing it this way, they became completely convinced. And then instead of this being something that made them feel insecure, it's something that they love doing because they, they, they they really address the audience uh, in close proximity. Another great approach to the symphony concert is the Gothenburg Symphony Orchestra. They, they fill the, uh, the square in front of the concert house with uh, small camping caravans, and groups of five to eight students come in and meet orchestral musicians in, before the concert, and they, and they talk about they don't really talk about the concert, and they talk about you know how the musician got started being a musician, and and what it's like to play an instrument, and and how it is to work in the orchestra, and they develop a relationship. So when the orchestra is on stage, and the and the kids are there, and they're in close proximity because the Gothenburg Symphony Orchestra, bless them, ropes off half their hall, so that the the kids have close proximity to the orchestra, and everybody knows somebody on stage. And that creates that direct relationship that's enough to get them engaged and to understand that what's happening on stage is relevant. That's all I've got right now, and now we've got time for questions. Thank you. We've only got a few minutes, I'm afraid, so we'll take um, a Thank, thank you. We've, we'll take a, a, just a, two or three of the questions that have come in. I'd like to start with the one um, about memorizing music. Um, we've seen some amazing examples of musicians uh, playing quite complex music from memory. Um, so how do you prepare the musicians for that kind of performance, bearing in mind many of them will have come through the, the traditional way of learning to play with music? And as a supplementary question to that, there must be a lot of musicians out there who are fantastic players and great communicators, but actually would really struggle without the music. Are they left out of this kind of work? So, how do you prepare the musicians to, to do this work without music stones and without music? Well, uh, I don't really have much uh, clout in that, because we don't have any budgets for saying rehearsal, uh, giving them rehearsal times to, to learn it. So, all we can do is uh, coax. Um, and, and in that sense, we've just uh, been lucky to work with some musicians that, that want to do that extra work. Uh, and also, like the, the, the string quartet example that I started with, uh, what, what happens once you start that, which is what uh, Scott is also saying, once you start that process and you feel the difference as a performer, I think that's really inciting you to do more of that. And, and, and of course, it's, it, it's not something you can do with a big symphony orchestra with a lot of concerts with different programs over two weeks or so. But uh, certainly, if, uh, if you're a, just a slightly smaller ensemble than that, it's really worth uh, thinking about. And it's something, personally, I think it's something they should work a lot more with while they're still in the conservatories, you know? Because it's so important. As far as, as, far as the uh, Norwegian Chamber Orchestra is concerned, they get paid extra for the preparation that it entails to, to memorize their program. But, but artistically, they're absolutely dedicated to it because now they've done so many programs from memory that as artists, they, they really understand the intimacy and the, and the benefits in their ensemble play that come from having their, their music memorized. And are there any that can't do it, you know, that, that can't cut that? No, no. Uh, so everyone in the orchestra can, can memorize, given enough time in rehearsal and budget to do that? Well, well since there's such a, a, a huge artistic payout from doing it for the chamber orchestra, everybody's really highly motivated. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, 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 I, ju I just wanted to add something. For instance, if, if we take Bach as an example, 
Um, the scores are like the, what they play, it's integrated a little bit like in the performance. So for instance, there are moments that they're like on the side and then in the middle like the video, like you see the video and it's a part of it. So for instance, there are parts that they do play, but it's, it's a part of the performance because they play with light also. Um, but of course, like in general, they know everything by heart. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to add, I think a lot of it has to do with tradition too, because I've noticed uh, often, and this is, this is one of my strong points when I've noticed, seen a group play, then I, I sort of keep track on how much do they actually use those note stands, because it's really just a tradition and it's there, and, and often they, they don't really look much into it anyway, you know, so get rid of the stuff, you know, and it, often it's, it, maybe it's just one piece that they really need it, but then it's there for the whole concert. So might as well just learn that. And I mean, any opera soloist can learn a Wagner opera, you know, from heart, by heart. Anybody can do it, you know. Another question that, that came through that is kind of related is, does that mean that conductors are no longer needed if the players are all, are all looking at each other, um, playing intuitively with each other? Do they need anyone to shape the sound and give them introduction cues and things? Well, I well, I've only worked with smaller ensembles, but but it should actually give them more, <laughs> more uh, uh, because if you look at a symphony orchestra, I, I often wonder: do they look at that conductor at all? Because they all seem to be looking in there, you know, every once in a while. But now, who are you? Who are you playing a symphony orchestra? You could probably tell: are you really just doing what you <laughs> what you want, or are you taking heat? Is it mostly in rehearsal? That's what I think. You know, sometimes it's probably that work is mostly done in rehearsal, and then you just, out of the corner of your eye, you can see a little. I don't know. I, I'm not. So well, it's it's the same for the chamber orchestras. They have somebody come in during the rehearsal periods and and, and work with them, so that they've got a, a single person that that uh, has opinions about the interpretation. Uh, but after a while, that is is just freed up and. The, the orchestra continues on its own. Uh, actually, it, it makes some challenges because it, it makes it increasingly harder to find uh, a conductor that doesn't get in the way of the music making of the ensemble. Uh, we've, I think we've got time just for one more question. Um, I'll come to you, Emma, with this one. Um, how do you avoid the performance being too gimmicky using props, uh, movements, costume? Does that distract from the music? Or does it enhance it? I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> but is there is a question around, are people looking at these visual images, the, all the very clever theatrical work, and missing something of the music because of that? Um, well, in, in general, I don't think uh, I'm thinking. It's always like the interaction with what you see. So do they miss something? No, because it's like an interaction always. And in that sense, the, like what you see, the projections, they add something to the music and also make you feel it. Um, you, you mean also like funny moments or, or you mean also like other kind of... Well, Erin has started by, by saying the music is the starting point. The yeah. music is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've seen some great examples of pieces which are much more than the music. They have a visual dimension. There, there is a lot of theater to it. Mm -hmm. And this, the question is, does the, the theater, the, the enhancements, the other sides to it, take away the audiences listening to the music so mm -hmm. much, so clearly, so focused on yeah. the music? I think, it, I think it depends how you do it. Um, you know, it's... it's um, yeah, it depends how you do it. I think, for instance, if you look at our performances, like the way they are dressed up, it's quite minimalistic often. And also, like, the stage, uh, I think it's quite minimalistic. So in that sense, also, the musicians, they feel really like, um, not like that they need to overact. And I think that's what, in general, what we try to do in our performances, that they don't overact, but, of course, they... Um, what we ask them, they, they work with an artistic, artistic director, so of course they learn how to uh, look at the public or, you know, they're, they're concerned about what they're doing. But we definitely don't ask them to be too funny or to overact or to look at me. It's really like, um, yeah, they need to feel at ease as well in a certain way because I think it starts with that they love what they are playing. And um, you really see this. We also have a new performance, Thelonious. And they asked to, to play uh, Thelonious, it's a, it's a jazz trio, 
and you see they love playing the music without like overacting, without, of course, it's staged because you are in, in New York, it's a jazz scene, but yeah, it's not, yeah, I think that's important not to overact and just, um, yeah. Okay. It's a shame we haven't got more time for questions, um, but I'm sure uh, our friends will be around all day for, for you to catch. Um, would you please thank uh, our wonderful presentations from Jesper, Emma, and Scott. Thank you.